All right, let's get started. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm giving a talk today on Build Once, Use Anywhere, using micro frontends with Svelte. So let's get started. My name is Evan Payne. I'm a senior frontend software engineer at Netcentric, a uh, European-based global business. Um, does a lot of interesting work, good consultancy, good values, really enjoyable place to be. Um, the other day, I put out a tweet uh, I was like, you know, is it crazy for you at work? Well, today I bounced between three projects that I lead. Uh, one was Angular inside of Adobe Experience Manager. Another was uh, a Svelte web component as a micro front end within uh, uh, two different places. And the third one was uh, moving our existing library or um, app into Vue 3 with Tailwind in an NX monorepo. All three very different technologies in some ways, uh, but uh, my, my thing was, can I kill my imposter syndrome now? I think I can handle this, but uh, in, imposter syndrome says no. <laughs> uh, it never goes away. And if this is starting off as a public service announcement. No matter how good you get at this, no matter how great you feel at the front end, if you have imposter syndrome, I don't think it goes away. There's always something that you don't know or that you're not certain about. And that's good. It can be good. Don't let it get you down. Now, to get to the point of this talk. Um, we had some different requirements that were required by for the client to develop a sort of proof of concept. So one of those was that we had one week to do it. Another was to build an app uh, feature that can run in two different places. Uh, so live within a pre-existing page or site and run on its own. It should also have a standalone development and deployment cycle, meaning it can be releasing new features all the time without the places where it's embedded needed uh, needing to uh, do anything. And it also needs to meet the web component standard. They were very clear on that. They wanted this to be a web component. So let's look at those one at a time. So first one was one week. And uh, yeah, that was, uh, that's accurate. That was a, a lot of pressure. And in the end, we had a little more time and that allowed us to do stuff, but we needed to work fast. So next one is maybe the core of what we're working on. Build once, use anywhere. So the setup we had was this. We had on the left-hand side our own managed site and server. Uh, top left to server, bottom left is uh, our own site. Um, we, on the right-hand side, we had Salesforce, um, or this could be any third party, uh, to be more generic, place uh, with its own set of servers and APIs. And usually the scenario is that they talk amongst themselves. And if you want them to talk to each other, the front ends, let's say, you need a lot uh, you need something that does the proxy and the back end and all that. So our existing setup was as it is. We wanted to build something that could live inside both of those front ends as a component essentially, uh, but, but work on its own and have a standalone development or deployment cycle. So what we came up with architecturally was something like this, where our feature app at the bottom uh, is on its own and it has a little proxy server so it has its own backend that it can have consistency with know what the APIs are there and then in exchange the proxy server does the cores handling all the stuff that's required to talk between the first server and the uh, Salesforce server um, allowing that the app only talks to that it doesn't have to worry about knowing authentication or if things have changed if things change its back end will handle it so trying to become a little flexible and the interesting thing here is that this is basically a micro front end you can embed this in both places they'll talk to the proxy server and get what they want so what's a micro front end um, this comes from a site microfrontends.org a good write up on that uh, the idea behind them is that the website or web app is a composition of features that make up things. And each feature should be owned by independent teams. So in some ways, it's saying that this team should be the whole stack. And the micro front end, yes, it's a part of that stack. That is what the deliverable is. But the back end parts, the APIs that it has, the interfaces, all that are also part of this team so that you can work in a sort of vertical silo. And it makes it a little easier to develop new features when you want to um, adapt them, when you want to improve them, because the rest of the site where this is used doesn't have to fix its updates, change its script order, any of that sort of stuff. It can be quite pleasant. And in our case, that's exactly what it, this does. We have our app that's embedded there. If something changes, this site doesn't need to upgrade because the way that it's embedded in there, it just knows the JavaScript and the root HTML hook. I'll show you that in a second. Um, and 
any updates that happen on this side, this will have to update, but that's okay too. This is a little bit faster uh, development process cycle. So the last piece of the puzzle was that it should be a web component, which is quite exciting. Um, there's a good site, webcomponents.dev, which goes through all the details, and this particular article goes all the ways to make a web component. And there are quite a lot. There's at least 20 uh, of them, including uh, Vue and React and uh, even Angular has Angular elements. But the part that look I looked into first was, OK, we're, we're doing some stuff that has potentially complex elements to it. We're building something that is, as a feature, even as a component, isn't just a component. It isn't just a um, slider or something. It's, it's something a lot more app-like in nature. So I want to use a framework of some sort. And smallest bundle was Svelte. And as soon as I saw that down there in the bundle size, I was like, I wanted to use Svelte forever. So in the end, we uh, did some comparisons, but chose to use Svelte. And the very interesting thing about Svelte is that it's truly reactive, meaning, uh, and you'll see once we get into the code a bit, it just kind of works really elegantly. And I liked seeing the discussions online as Svelte was coming up to its latest version 3 um, with between Rich Harris, who created Svelte, and uh, Evan Yu, who created Vue. I've seen them in GitHub comments, like going back and forth, talking about the potential of proxies and uh, reactivity within their systems. It's nice to see the front-end community kind of uh, grow together in that way. Svelte is very interesting. I have had a good time, and I'll, I'll show you why. So once we decided on the architecture, building a web component using Svelte and putting it into a micro front end kind of concept so that it can be embedded anywhere, now it's just time to build it. So let's dive in. Uh, if you want to follow along afterwards, the demo code is here, but let's dive into the actual code. So uh, Svelte, like Vue, has uh, single file uh, components. So in any one, you will have a script tag, uh, your style tag, and then your HTML uh, at the bottom. Different than view, which is HTML inside the template at the top. Doesn't matter. It's the same kind of concept. So all you need to do to make a regular Svelte component, a sort of top level one, um, a, a custom element so that you can embed it on a page, is add this to the Svelte options at the top. The tag is item detail SPA in our case. This is what our custom element tag will be. And in your rollup config, or however you build it, you need to pass through the Svelte option of custom element true. With that, in your, uh, this is our sort of demo page, you can then add this item detail SPA. And when you load the page and render it, whatever you've told Svelte to create will be created there. So already off the bat, I was really happy to find that, hey, this is done. <laughs> um, I don't have to jump through a lot of hoops to set up this. Svelte just does it under the hood already, it comes along with the package. No imports, no, nothing fancy, uh, it just works. And if you were to embed this now, whatever you create, in another place, all you would need to do is make sure you load the script that is generated by your build here, single JavaScript file, um, this one in particular. Um, this is the development version, but that needs to be loaded. And then if it finds this element on the page, or whenever this element is added to the page, then it will bootstrap and run the app as expected. And that's the perfect situation for what we need here. We potentially will be navigating within a single page app to a section that uses this item detail that we're going to create here. And we want it to be able to load asynchronously and just work without needing anything other than the script and the uh, the tag that passes in. OK, so that's step one. Step two is passing in parameters. So in our script tag, in, in any Svelte component, um, you will declare props by exporting them. So export let preview will give you an input uh, prop of preview. Uh, we need that, so in case we don't want to use the real API, we can use the dummy data. <clears throat> and we uh, will also uh, take in an issue ID, a base API URL. Not always necessary if your API is on the same server as the page you're on, so allow the uh, apps where this is embedded to decide that, and a theme just to show that we can do something like that. Um, here I'm using TypeScript because I love TypeScript. I use it on like all of my frameworks now, uh, Angular and Vue, uh, and it was nice to see it was supported in the latest releases of Svelte. So all I'm doing here is declaring a type, um, so saying that when we get this data back from the server, it'll be I have an ID, name, and description as strings. Then I'm declaring data. So this is a property that'll change over time. And you'll see later that we use this, and this is what we're actually going to use in our template to display the data. 
Um, these are some helper functions. Uh, get data, get dummy data will return after three seconds uh, an ID with this name and description of this issue. And if you needed to for uh, extend to say what the API endpoint for this was. So the base URL is one thing, but they don't always know what the API's um, call should be. Um, this you can specify this. So in particular, we'll use that. We would use that, let's say, inside get data to properly specify the endpoint. Okay, now we get to the core of what Svelte's reactivity system is like. You have this dollar sign equals or dollar sign set to um, basically anything inside this wrapper will evaluate whenever one of the outside declared properties changes. So if preview changes its value, this statement will rerun. Same for if issue ID or base API URL change, which you know this statement is setting data equal to the response. So get data or get dummy data are promises. So data is going to be a promise that resolves to an issue. So it's an asynchronous property in particular. And one caveat I noticed, which I don't think happens in re inside regular components when you're inside a system, is in the web component version, the props fire one after the other, meaning as the component loads, it sets them in the same order that you do it. So in our case, we relied upon preview being undefined. As long as it is not undefined, we'll evaluate this. So until it's actually set, true or false, which means it's a required property, um, we won't do anything. So here and here, what we discovered is if we put preview tr first true or preview true in the first place, it would happen too early. Issue ID would still be undefined. Theme would still be undefined. So we had to put it at the very end to make sure that it was the last one that was evaluated. But besides that, that just kind of works. Um, when preview is set, it checks is it uh, set to true or false. If it's false and there's no issue ID, um, or and there is an issue ID, we will get the data from the actual server. If it's anything else or somehow we forgot the issue ID, we'll get the dummy data. So that is helpful. It could be more in depth, we'll figure it out, but that's quite nice. So then in the actual template itself, down at the bottom, we have our class with the background, the wrapper class. And inside here is where we use this. Uh, Svelte has something that's more or less like um, uh, suspense that React and now Vue have as well, um, where you await for this data. So this is our promise. While it is resolving, uh, you have this loading state that you can put in. So during those first three seconds, we can just kind of wait for it to happen. Then uh, once it resolves, once it's promised that then, you declare a variable, here I'm calling it issue, and then if there is an issue, uh, I just make sure and I display it as a template, issue name and, and description. So if something goes wrong, you also have a catch block where you can display if something goes wrong. And that's, that's all that's needed. So in our particular case now, we're going to double check in our main TS, we're using app A, and I'm going to npm run dev, and we should be able to open this. Loads very quickly because it's not a very complex app. But you see we have our loading state, and after three seconds it fills in the issue details. That is quite fancy. If we were to go over here to our index.html and change the theme to dark, let's say, that would update. Background is now dark, and we have a different theme. So very little effort to get to a very first starting point for us to have. This is now a web component that can be used anywhere. And again, to keep in mind, this script and this custom element are all that you need on a particular page. Once it's there, it just works. And that is exactly what we wanted. But we wanted to also go a little bit further. And so one thing that we wanted to say, OK, well, look, we might need the user to click on something in this app, and then we'll need to tell the parent application, the parent page, that something has happened. So I need an event of some sort, an output, if you were thinking in terms of components. So Svelte makes this also really easy. It was, uh, it took us a few seconds to find it, but in the end, what we're going to do is we're going to set a query selector on the item detail SPA, so this custom element, and we'll add a listener for this custom event, item detail spa success. And when it happens, we'll console log the success and the event itself to show what's possible. So how do we actually get that to do something? So we're going to go into app B here. And um, up at the top, what we found was that Svelte has this internal thing, which is exposed for now. Um, I hope that it will be in the future or moved up to a more top level, because this is quite useful. Get current component. And if we go down here uh, to this bit, this is all I added here. So 
I define component as get current component, and then I create a method, a success, called success, which when it runs will create a new custom event, item detail, SPA success, like we wanted. And in here, the most important property I think is composed true, which will make it jump out of the shadow DOM boundary. Um, and bubbles and cancelable are other things you can set, but detail as well, you can pass through data, which is also quite nice. Then when, again, when that runs, it creates it, and then component, the get current component, will dispatch that event and that just works. So it's already built in. It will it will do the work to set it up so that it emits the custom event. Um, then down here in our template, I created a button and say on click, run a method which will call the success method. So anytime they click, we should be seeing that console log. That's already set in place. I will change our import in our main file to app B so we can use that one. And when we come back to the page, it's loading and we see this button. I realized earlier I forgot to mention that the component that we see on the page and one of the things that's nice is it is a shadow DOM. So you have the component that's on the HTML and this is your kind of app shell if you want. It might have other elements and other apps on it. And inside here is a self-contained shadow DOM that has our styles and our container with our issue and everything we want to do in here. So that satisfies the web component part of it. Okay, but if we click on this then we see success, custom event. It works, it does what we want it to do, and we have the data that comes through in the uh, event as well. Again, it didn't take very long for us to get that done. It just kind of worked and came along for the ride out of the box was felt. Very exciting for me. Okay, the last thing that I want to show you is here in App C. Um, this, uh, <laughs> there's a, th a thing in front end that's been going and waiting for quite a long time, which is called container queries. And the idea is you want to, at different breakpoints, be able to change stuff, but not the media, not the window or the browser size, because especially when you're dealing with micro front ends and in these places, you don't know that the browser size has anything to do with where you're being displayed, all right? Um, you could be in a sidebar, you could be in a full width container, you could have a parent width of 400 pixels or 1,800 pixels. You just don't know for sure. So you have to actually focus in and think of this in terms of what is the size of my parent? What's the container that I'm inside? And write your media query, so to speak, as container queries instead. So Svelte made that quite easy. I have this element width variable, and if we look down in the template, um, Svelte has this thing called bind client width. And what that does is it says, hey, what size am I currently? And anytime that changes, it will set the variable equal to set element width equal to that value already right off the bat that is super handy so we have a constantly are able to track the width with again just kind of one line two lines of code um, and then we also want to then set a class so this will be our kind of hacky version of media queries but let's see where we actually do that so again you're declaring current breakpoint it's going to be something that changes over time um, then what I added down here in our reactivity section was I defined our breakpoints so we want to do mobile first and then we have medium upwards uh, if you're larger than 765 or uh, large as 1280. Then in a reactive statement so when breakpoints or element width which are defined outside when those change this whole statement will run again and it'll reset the current breakpoint and what I want to get out of that is a, a list of class names so I'm reducing over these values to check, hey, is the element width greater than or equal to 765? If so, give me BP medium up, otherwise don't give me anything, and then joining them together with spaces. So when you get up to 1290 pixels, you should have both of these classes being added. And then all you have to do is in the template, set that class name and use it. So in our particular case, we have this button, which has a width at a of 100% now, uh, at mobile sizes. But when we get to breakpoint medium up, when it's a child of breakpoint medium up, then with 100 pixels. So the benefit of having this at top level of your web component is that it, you can just use it throughout your templates like this. If I'm a child of this class, keep it as flat as possible. And I mean, that just worked. So here we are at a larger breakpoint. If I shrink it down, I have 100%. I will go show you the class changing as well. So background dark, position relative, if I scroll uh, open a little bit, 
up to our breakpoint. There, we see BP medium up is applied and it takes the CSS. So this is something that, you know, yes, the browsers have media queries, but, but container queries are traditionally a little bit harder to implement because you need to do the JavaScript. And it's not that the JavaScript isn't still there, it's just that we didn't have to write it because Svelte had this for us baked in out of the box. Um, what you'll see as you add in features like this is that your bundle size expands. So when we were compiling, uh, th when we compiled app C, it's uh, 1,000 lines of code unminified and everything. Um, if we were to change this back to our very simple app A and hit save, and it'll re-render this and we'll check this and it's 884. So Svelte only includes what you're actually using. That said, these are quite modern and they're written quite modern and if you as long as you can support you know uh, browsers that can run ES 2015 uh, or higher you'll get a lot of uh, benefit out of this and once it's minified and, and gzipped and all of that it, it can be quite a small bundle okay so that's my <laughs> general uh, talk about all of this um, and how we actually implemented it and again to reiterate it was simple it we got stuck for a few times but we ended up being a lot faster than we might have been with some other frameworks where you know we had to struggle to figure out how to, to do the custom elements or container queries or any of that stuff so in the end success um, yeah we we implemented everything we needed to um, we got it done really quickly and it allowed us time to do more than we had expected actually so that was quite a pleasant experience overall um, if you're thinking forward about this, if uh, one, some pointers that you might want to keep in mind. One is to keep the contract stable. Um, it is pretty important to uh, have a, a fixed number of properties and, and keep them as they are. The reason being, uh, if you change one and an app cannot deploy uh, for, for six months their newest version, which has your updated script tag um, or your new properties, their app will break. So you do need to version your scripts uh, and, and also keep the contract as stable as you can so it doesn't get difficult to implement or, or move stuff around. Uh, something that can help with that is to create a manifest file where you can programmatically uh, give the information so that if they did happen to do a build, they could uh, find the newest version or fix themselves to a current version. The other thing to keep in mind is it is totally possible, and you probably will if you embrace this sort of micro front end solution, over time you will embed multiple single page apps. You might go all with Svelte, or you might do another one that's in React because that team prefers that, or Angular. That's one of the nice things is you can kind of pick your own way uh, of doing all of this. Vanilla uh, JavaScript framework or a web component would work as well. If so, then you need an orchestration layer. You need something that will be responsible for the actual loading of the dependencies so that if you have two apps that are running uh, React on the same page and the same version of React, then you only need to load that script once. Um, there's a few other considerations as well as how do they talk to each other if they need to, shared state, user IDs, things like that. Um, it can go, it can get quite complex, but there's a framework called Single SPA which seemed to tick all the boxes and cover all the cases, so worth looking into um, if you're going that direction. Now, the last topic is what do I actually think of micro front ends as an architectural choice? So, um, they're a great fit for web components. They were perfect for what we needed. Um, you do have this self contained, encapsulated uh, methodology. They fit into both places and you can update them in one place. Perfect fit. They're nice for a diverse architecture where you don't have control over all of the elements in the full stack, like we did in this case as well, having another API or another server entirely that really wasn't under our development process at all. That being said, they're probably not the best case for all use cases. If you control your stack in full, if it's your backend, your microservices, your front end and such, it's probably overkill. You can probably find better ways to do that. Um, I'm not completely sold on the idea, but again, in this particular case, it was a perfect fit. So I'm, I was really pleased with the end results. And that's it for my talk. If you have questions, this being a pre-recorded talk, please get in touch with me uh, at Evan Future on Twitter and let me know what you think. If you agree, if you disagree, any way, conversation is always welcome. Um, thank you for your time, and I will see you again next time.